and uh, welcome to the Trans Forum. And today we are going to be talking about surgery. And we have three guests with us today. We have uh, Cash, who is FTM, and uh, can share from that perspective a little bit about surgery. We have Chloe, who is actually just just post ops so there's some really cool perspectives i'm sure she has to share with us from that perspective and we have stacy and stacy um unfortunately is not feeling very well today so she's going to keep her camera off and uh, we're going to be able to have her chime in by voice so thank you for joining us stacy in, in spite of the fact that you're not well stacy uh, if you watched her videos you know that she has some history with being trans um, uh, right from the 1960s and um, has not only had surgery but has had to have a revision so we're very glad that she could be here and uh, share some of her perspectives as well so uh with those short introductions and maybe we'll just uh, get each of you to introduce yourselves a little bit and tell us a little bit more about yourself so we'll start with cash uh, hi everyone so my name is cash uh, my pronouns are he him or they them and uh yeah so i identify as uh, a transgender man um and lean a little bit more towards a non-binary and um i'm just excited to be here today to talk about surgery i think it's uh it's an important topic okay. chloe Hey everyone, uh, my name is Chloe Anne Sophie Veyer. I'm 42 years old, a trans woman. I came out to myself only two years ago, and I've had recently a GRS, so bottom surgery, and two months ago, FFS, so facial surgery. And uh, Stacy. Morning, everybody. Stacy Love Jolliker, she, her for pronouns. Uh, as Carrie said, a longtime trans person, I came out in 1967 at a time when uh, to be trans wasn't even really heard of. So great to be here. Uh, I've had surgery, uh, bottom surgery, uh, three times. So uh, I, I bring a little bit of a different perspective to it, as Gary said. So great to be here. Thanks. Awesome. So we're going to just dive right in with the questions here, guys. Um, we, um, one of the biggest questions that I hear is why? Right. Like, I mean, we we've already gone a lot through this journey, presenting the way we do being this and and um, forgive me by saying this word, but um, I, I often hear the word mutilation put in there, you know, like, why do this to yourself? Right. So I think that's really the biggest question uh, we want to throw out there. If we just start with the big one. Let's uh, let's see what you guys think and what you have to say about that. Well, you know, every time I looked in the mirror and I saw that little thing hanging down there between my legs, it just drove me crazy. Um, you know, that um, I was having this appendage um, and it didn't feel right at all. So that was my why. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. It's a similar situation with me. It was like every time I looked in the mirror and I was like, this extra tissue doesn't belong here. Um, you know, I always found that it was like sort of, um, the only thing that um that i could focus on like uh, in terms of like almost like disgust um yeah so it, and it was like almost like holding me back um is how i could describe it because it was just always uh, on, on my mind always in the way yeah yeah um dysphoria is definitely the big factor i want to say uh, you, you you hear a lot of people, cis and trans alike, uh, who will ask you, like, why are you getting FFS? You already passed. You're, you're so pretty and things like that. This is a super common one uh, for FFS in particular. Uh, so any kind of uh, facial surgery. Uh, and, and personally, I would always answer, it's not the fact people misgender me, because that was not happening in my case. It's not the fact that like, people are clucking me or like staring at me. It's, it's for myself. It's when I would catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror. Sometimes I would catch the right angle and see like my authentic self. I would be happy and smiling. And other times my brain would just focus on the wrong part. And then that would hit the, hit me. Like it would be like a dagger to the heart. And that felt like shit. Uh, and it can ruin your day. Like, especially if it happens early in the day. Um, so, so, so yeah, like bottom surgery like doesn't really do that and, and, and oddly enough is the one that in canada is paid for as if it's kind of like the biggest deal uh, and and to me i find it weird because i'm like 
like you see your face and people see your face quite a lot more than people see your genitals. Uh, although I did get GIS and it's not for sexual reasons because I'm on the uh, asexual spectrum. Uh, it's, it's the same thing as, as Stacy and, and Cash for, um, the, the, the same experience is that you, you feel a discomfort, like this is not right and, and you want to fix it. What's the scariest thing for you about thinking about surgery and, and going forward with it? Well, I had no fears whatsoever. Oh, yeah, I was going to say for me, it's um, it was kind of like everyone always like around me in terms of doctors and, and, you know, when I had to go through like the psychological assessment to get approval and stuff, it was always so focused on regret. Um, even like my partner at the time was like, well, what if you regret it and stuff like that? And it, it was, that was my biggest fear. I was like, oh my God, am I going to regret this? Um, not knowing um, that it would be just like the complete opposite. It would be so freeing and it was, um, it, yeah, just extremely liberating. So. so so in my case, I'm a bit blessed. I, I have what's called a fantasia. So I mean, unable to picture things in my head. I don't really like see things when people describe them. I, I collect facts and, and put words in, in a notepad kind of thing, but I don't really see anything. So when I went to do FFS and GRS, I had no idea what to expect. I came in no, with no expectations. This is really hard to be disappointed when you don't have expectations. Um, so, so I didn't have any fear of that nature myself uh, going in like there, there there is a bunch of fears um and, and one of the one of the weird one is kind of like every big surgery as a fear as a possibility like a statistical possibility that you will not wake up from it like it can be fatal um my, my girlfriend literally told me like this is not something you should worry about because if it happens it, you won't care right like other people might but uh, for you it's kind of like well that's it, I guess. Um, so, so, so that's a good way, I guess, to to place it. Um, but yeah, of course, you, like FFS, if you botch the job and your face looks hideous or worse than it did before the surgery, uh, then you live with that face for the rest of your life, for the most part. So, so uh, yeah, it's I, don't, I think it's impossible to step into these without some form of anxiety like spiking in. Um, but I, the fact I got two surgery back to back really helped me be super confident entering the second one because the first one essentially taught me to trust uh, the experts, to have faith in my staff and doctors that I picked after like deliberation and just go in and, and like they're doing a lot of those like surgeries and I'll be well taken care of. Mm -hmm. So. So that helps. But yeah, I think everybody, like a lot of people have fear of surgery, especially before they have their first one. What would you have liked to have known about before you went into surgery that maybe you learned during or after? Definitely um, the healing, the, the way sort of um, the healing would go. So like for me, I didn't realize that I wasn't going to be able to lay down flat in my bed for like almost two months. Um, I, I remember just being like having to lay on like the recliner on the couch. Um, and that's how I had to sleep every night for, yeah, for almost two months. Um, and I'm, I'm just like, I'm on my stomach, like I sprawl out when I sleep. So it was like super weird for me to just kind of be in one spot the entire night, um, having to sleep. So for me, that was, that was one thing that, um, that I didn't expect because I mean, sleep is a big part of your life. You don't think um, about sort of how that would be interrupted. I, I don't think when you're, when you have all this other stuff about surgery on your mind, um, that sort of falls to the bottom. Um, yeah. So that would have been a big thing for me was like just how the healing was going to be and how it was going to affect um, something like sleep. Yeah. Sleep quality is a really important part of healing, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've exactly. Heard that from yeah. Yeah, you have to be comfortable so you can heal. Um, you have to be able to sleep soundly so that you can heal. Um, I mean, I did eventually. I, I think you just, your body is like, okay, I need to sleep. And you just kind of just fall asleep wherever you are at some point. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it felt like uh, it felt like it, it made the healing time feel longer sort of in that regard. 
Yeah, be, being somebody who sleeps on your back is the blessing when you go into <laughs> surgery because most of the time you're forced to sleep on your back and so people just can't do it. They have never done it in their life. Um, I'm a back sleeper, so I got lucky. Um, for, for, for something that I wish I would know, I, I want to say that for the most part, I, I did thorough research in every surgery I got, so I, I knew what to expect. But uh, FFS really hit me hard from the like the wake up from surgery all the way to day eight uh, i felt really terrible so so my my appearance with as a certain point my happiness with my own appearance with a certain point and after surgery it went down quite a bit and it took like eight days until it reached pretty much the same point and then ever since it's been going upwards and i and i knew that like the theory was told to me that it takes three months before it's kind of mostly done and a year and six months before it's fully healed. Um, and that's when you're going to see your real face that the surgeon have made uh, a year and a half ago. Um, but I don't think anything really can prepare you to that, that incredible depression. Post-surgery depression is, is really a thing. Uh, and there, there's a team of psychologists supporting you and, and other people going through surgery supporting you. Uh, which really helps. But that's the part I think that no amount of reading will really prepare you for how you're going to feel about that. In contrast to how you felt, um, I was like elated. Um, it felt like the world uh, was off my, the world weight was off my shoulders. So it, for me, it was a very positive experience. And um, I guess maybe going into that surgery was, you know, an expectation of, you know, getting rid of that uh, feeling that I had that I wasn't congruent with how I say, seen myself in society. So um, it, for me, it was a, a positive, very, very positive thing. Yeah, that was, I mean, again, not to sort of, not to, to overshadow Poe's experience, because, I mean, post-op depression is is very real, and it's it's actually quite common. Um, but my more aligned with sort of with, with what Stacy said is that, um, it was it was actually hard to describe sort of the the sort of um relief that that i felt after like the sort of liberation i guess you could say it was, it was a liberating experience um i didn't actually expect that i would feel the way i did i don't think i really had anything to compare it to um so it was almost like the first time in my life that i had felt the way i did it was almost like um a, a sort of the fog kind of <laughs> went away of, of, for the depression um for, for quite some time i mean it, it returns because life returns and stuff like that you know and you go back to sort of your quote-unquote normal life afterwards but uh in terms of, of like right after and for quite a while um yeah it was it was just it was liberating and now i just feel in in different areas of my life like i can actually um live it in a way that's different than i could before yeah i'm I don't know if it's me or my autism or a combination of, of these things, but um, I guess I am a creature of habit. I am a, I'm somebody who changes my opinion or my taste very slowly. Um, and, and I, I absolutely see these things. Uh, like I got breast augmentation together with FFS and at the, at the beginning, it was closer to regret than, than like relief or happiness. Um, now that I'm two months afterwards, that that completely changed. Like I'm I'm quite happy I got the surgery, or that surgery. Um, but but I think in my case it takes me a long a longer time to warm up to change. Like when change happens, it's it's more like of a of a, a like a negative reaction. Like I'm at, I'm change averse, I suppose. Um, and 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 yeah, I suppose that's a Chloe thing. <laughs> Well, although it's not just glory, like I've seen other people going through the same thing, but I think pain too is sort of a huge factor, right? Like when we're, um, our bodies are in pain for, for whatever reason, which, you know, they're going to be after most surgeries, it's hard to sort of see through that. Um, you know, even though you have like your pain meds and stuff like that, when, when your body is, is sort of debilitated with, um, with pain, it's, it's, it's easier to feel regret than it is to feel happy because I mean, you're, everything is firing in your body to sort of get through those painful moments. So that I think contributes a lot to, to the regret in the beginning too. 
Now, Stacy, you had the situation where you had the surgery and then later had to have a revision too. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> back in 1998, uh, when I had my first surgery, I've had three. Uh, the first one was in 1998 and um, it was done by a doctor who is not proficient um, in um, GRS. Um, he was proficient in removal of the penis and testes. He was a cancer specialist that was trained to do that for the male population, but he was not trained to create a, a, a vulva or a vagina um, from the materials. So um, he did the best he could with what he had at the time. And for me, uh, it was really just getting rid of that stuff down there that um, was the most important part. However, um, his technique um, did not allow for um, a positive outcome and for myself anyways, in my expectations to be um, the female that I seen myself as. So, um, but it, it also caused me a great deal of uh, physical pain. Um, and I uh, underwent, um, you know, a terrible time for a couple of years, um, having trouble um, to be intimate with people um, because of the pain that I experienced um, with arousal. And then in 2012, I had another, a, a revision to the first surgery done um, to remove that pain. And what they discovered was um, that they had actually um, not removed all of the erectile tissues. And um, it was basically just tucked up on inside. And um, that's what was causing the issues for me in terms of pain. So... They, they took out all that stuff um, in the second one, um, but it still wasn't functioning the way that um, it should have. Um, so I had very little depth and very little um, size in terms of uh, accommodation for male partners. Um, so um, that's when I started to um, really kind of take a look at some possibilities and um, Fortunately for myself, um, Dr. Borasar um, was able to uh, do a complete revision. And um, he said to me um, after the surgery, the day after, actually, he said, you know, Stacy, he said, that's probably one of the most complicated ones I've ever done in my life because he had to do what he called a pelvic scrape. And what that is, is take everything out that had been done. And of course, having that done um, also meant there was lack of material to create the uh, vagina and cavity. So I ended up having skin grafts taken from my leg, um, which was for me um, was more painful than the actual surgery itself. And um, I, I, I actually had a, a tremendous amount of bleeding from the skin grafts and had to have some transfusions from that as well. So um, it was a hugely invasive surgery. And, um, you know, typical heal time, they say, you know, it's about uh, six to eight weeks. Um, however, for myself, it's, it was almost three years um, before I actually felt comfortable enough to um, start using um, my, my female parts. I think the, the fear of sort of, um, complications is, is pretty common. Um, you know, and I think that yes, medical advancements have happened. I mean, because science, technology, you know, all of that advances, but we have to be careful that we, we sort of don't take away from the fact that, um, trans people have been here for years. Um, you know, we are not the first sort of generation, despite what people say, to, you know, come out and, and proceed with medical transition. So I, I think we have to be careful too that, you know, when we're talking about all the medical advancements that we also acknowledge that, you know, um, for a lot of people, it is revision, uh, like Stacey's. Um, and that does come with sort of more, um, more that has to sort of be involved with the actual procedure. 
Um, so I think, I think it's important that we do acknowledge that yes, medical science has advanced. Um, but for people who have, you know, been out for years and started transitioning years ago, um, that, that new technology looks very different for them and sort of how the, the surgery can go in terms of revision. There are definitely absolutely even though things have advanced for sure. Are there are there any things that you guys have encountered that um, you would say are probably not really worth the risk as far as things people consider? And obviously that's a personal thing, right? But <laughs> in my case, absolutely no. Like there's no regret for either surgery. I mean, I'm still in the painful and difficult part of my first month post-surgery of GRS, which means I have no life. Um, I, I can afford it though. So like I'm highly privileged that I can afford to take the three month break to take care of myself. And I have a support network. Like I live currently at my elder brother's place uh, for a month. And then I fly back home in Vancouver where I'm gonna pull some favors from either friends or colleagues or partner. Uh, but not everybody can do that, right? So, so, so that that is a privilege that allows me to do this. But now that the fact I can do it, I've done it, and I have no regret. Like, like even even the the financial aspect, uh, FFS was extremely expensive, um, something al along the lines of seventy thousand Canadian, and and that's something I wish the government would cover, and. But but or at least like make it tax deductible or something. Um, but but there is there is no regret. Like um, I would I would encourage anybody who seeks surgery to to go for it if like if they ask me. The privilege privilege is a big thing. Um, you know, I was in the position where I could save up for the the chest contour in which ended up being almost $3,000 out of pocket, um, which I mean, for myself, like I'm, I haven't been working because I'm a student, I'm a university student. Um, so I've just been, that's so sort of been my focus for quite a few years. So, um, you know, I'm still sort of in the financial situation in terms of, um, you know, like uh, with OSAP, with um, my partner, like all that kind of stuff. Um, I was able to sort of set money aside for that, including, you know, travel costs, because I'm, I'm in Northern Ontario. So it's, you know, almost nine hours to get to Toronto for the surgery, had to stay for a couple of days, that sort of all adds up, um, you know, bringing support people with me, they have to take time off work. Um, so all that sort of stuff does qualify. I mean, in my opinion, anyway, I can't speak for everyone. Um, but that sort of qualifies as, as a privileged aspect that, um, that a lot of people don't have, especially, um, younger individuals, right? Like if you're sort of in that, say 18 to 25 range, that's a really difficult sort of position. You're trying to figure out, you know, what potentially if you're going to do post-secondary or, you know, trying to figure out jobs, um, living situations, whether you have support networks, that sort of all factors into what you can do in terms of, um, and of surgeries, if, if that's sort of the route that you want to take. And it also depends on on where you live and, and if you can sort of afford the constant travel that comes with it. That raises another interesting question that you hear a lot, right? Is a lot of people will say, okay, well, fine, you're trans and, and you want to be this way, but, it, but it's an elective surgery, right? So why should the government pay for it? So how do you guys feel about that? <laughs> that actually, so during COVID, um, when the lockdowns were happening and they sort of canceled, um, you know, elective surgeries. And, and it, to me, I was like, that's, <laughs> that's not elective surgery. Like that has consequences, um, you know, just as it did for, for all other sectors, you know, um, sort of non-emergent cancer surgeries, all that kind of stuff that was being considered elective, um, that has consequences. Um, so it, that had consequences on the trans community as well um, to feel sort of like, well, you're optional almost. So like, we're going to put you over here. Um, yeah, so that would that sort of like, it's, you know, um, necessary versus versus um, a choice is, to me, it's like, it's, it's for some people, it's necessary to be okay with themselves. Um, and for some people, it's a choice. And they say, you know, I'll do it, I'll do it later, or I want to do this first or, or something like that. And, and of course, that's valid as well. Yeah, I, 
I touch a bit on, on the fact that I, I think it's weird that in Canada, or at least Quebec and, and Ontario and Vancouver, the main areas that I'm familiar with how it works, um, the GRS is covered, but not FFS. I know that Yukon uh, covers everything. Go Yukon. Um, but it's, it, I absolutely understand from, uh, like 60 years ago or 40 years ago or 20 years ago, even, uh, that GRS would be considered like mandatory because of the way transitioning happened back then, where it was extremely like gate kept and only people who had a chance to pass and also were straight, uh, would, would get surgeries and would get to transition like you as well, essentially on the internet there was this like forums about like what exactly do you tell people t- in order to transition and that fake story about always knowing ever since you were a little child or whatever um which was not necessarily true but it was kind of like the answer you had to give in order to transition so so back then they wanted trans people to not exist uh, so you would get a new identity, you would move to a new town, you would get like a new name, a new fake background, a new fake past, and they would tell you, basically, um, don't tell anyone your towns. It was like a shameful secret. So so having GRS made sense, and it was required back then for name change. It was GRS first, then name change. Uh, it's in 2015, I think, or 16, that it changed in, Ke- in Quebec, at least, where you could just say, I'm towns, this is my new name and new gender. And the surgery was absolutely optional. And that's a big, interesting change. But the fact insurance costs and medical costs are still in the old era of thinking GRS is the most important thing, the critical point of transitioning. I think it's wrong and weird, especially since a lot of people these days don't necessarily want to get rid of their genitals. They're fine with theirs. Um, I'm not in that box, so I took the free surgery. But but it's it's... It's weird. And like I said, FFS is something that everyone interface with your face, like everyone you see in the street. And that's also like such a bigger, important thing when I see myself in the mirror way more often in the day than I see my genitals in the mirror every day. Um, so I, I personally think that they have it upside down right now that the, the government should switch that. But I understand also that to some people it's considered elective or aesthetic and plastic surgery and why would cis woman not get it for free and my answer to that would be sure why not give it to them for free as well like isn't that what the whole healthcare system is there for anyway um but yeah my opinion well the 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 government funding is is sort of interesting in, in terms of ontario so my option um, for my top surgery was that I could have gone to GRS Montreal or um, or stayed in Ontario. So initially, I had gotten on the wait list with with uh, GRS in Montreal because um, so OHIP coverage, which is the the health insurance plan in Ontario, would have covered the contouring. Um, so essentially, um, it would have been free. They also would have covered. Um, a stay in a hotel and they would have covered meals. You just had to pay for any prescriptions. Um, so that was a huge incentive for, for me to, to go to Montreal. Um, now I ended up actually going with, with McLean clinic in Toronto. Um, but that was based solely, um, because they had openings, they had opened it up, um, like sort of, um, uh, randomly, like they, they sort of allocate spots to sort of, um, open up for, for people who've been waiting a while. So I was fortunate enough to get in through that. Um, uh, but again, sort of that that financial cost that it's like, if I wasn't able to afford what ended up being like in total for that sort of week $5,000, then like in out of pocket up front, then, you know, I would have been sort of back on the wait list um, to get the insurance coverage through OHIP. Um, so, I, you know, if if it's not, you know, provincial, or, you know, uh, federal coverage, something depending on where you live. Um, I think that at least private insurance, you know, benefit packages through employment and stuff like that. I think there should be something that they, they allow it. Um, cause right now in my experience, they don't cover any of that. I've tried, um, yeah, like Chloe saying the same experience for her. I tried, um, going through, through private insurance for, um, 
uh, prosthetic devices as well. Cause I mean, they'll cover, um, prosthetic leg stuff like that. Um, they won't cover sort of trans related prosthetics. Um, that's something that I sort of encountered. Um, but yeah, the fact that private insurance isn't able to sort of pick up what, what the provincial coverage doesn't, um, I think is, is pretty disappointing because I think that if, if they can cover a lot of the, the cis normative sort of, um, options for, you know, aesthetic surgery sometimes, um, you know, and not to take away from people who have had uh, breast cancer and, and had breast removal. I, I don't want to take away from that experience. That's extremely traumatic and, and should be covered. Um, I just, I think that in addition to that, we should also be factoring in other people who have sort of um, breast extra tissue related needs that also needs um, coverage in that regard, whether it be gender or anything else. Because if aesthetics are important to uh, cisgender women, um, you know, then they should be important to transgender women seeking to go back into the sort of into that cisgender binary for their own needs. Um, so I don't know, like, like if, what Stacy would um, has in terms of experience with getting surgery, sort of, you know, um, many years ago in terms of coverage. That, that was just my personal experience with with the provincial coverage. Stacy, so thank you for seeing that, that coverage change over the years. Yeah, I the uh, definitely I'm going to chime in here because for me that was a very different experience. And back in 1998, most of it was not covered, um, so um, it became uh, um, a huge um, financial nightmare afterwards. But uh, anyways, we got that straight note. Um, and you know, you got to remember that you know Ministry of Health here in Ontario um, really, really had to come up and step up to the plate. And the reason being is we had a disproportionate number of people that were suiciding because they weren't able to get their surgeries. They weren't able to align themselves with how they felt about themselves. And surgery became an absolute must um, to save people's lives. And I think that's an important element that we need to remember, right? And here in Ontario, you know, with the revisions of uh, the Ministry of Health guidelines, the protocols and guidelines in terms of trans competent care. Um, that changed drastically in, in 2018. And it really allowed more people to be um, so um, in tune with themselves and become comfortable enough to be in society. And, you know, we hear it all the time. You know, how come all these trans people are starting to come out now? Well, they're coming out because of changes that have been made for them to be comfortable in their bodies, to be comfortable in society, to have that recognition and to have the acceptance of people without disregard for discrimination. So I think this is a huge part that we really need to uh, remember that it wasn't always so easy just to get through the tree. And it's still not easy. I mean, when you think about the, uh, the process, you know, you have to be approved by two doctors or a doctor and a psychologist or a psychiatrist or social worker. So um, and then you have to, you know, get the ministry approval. And then the ministry, once the ministry is approved, you know, then they send off the application to whichever clinic you've chosen. And then they do their own assessment whether or not they want to do it. So, um, you know, it ha it's not an easy process. And you, you just don't automatically say, OK, well, I want surgery. Um, you know, so, um, it's not just, you know, oh, well, why should they get it? And, and, you know, um, and why should, you know, the ministry pay for it? Right. So, um, it's been a long, long time coming. And I think it's an absolute huge benefit to not only people, but also our population and our community, um, to allow us those opportunities. Yeah, there's certainly yeah. a lot of changes and, and a lot of good things coming along the way. Um, you mentioned, Cash, about uh, per private insurance not necessarily covering that. And yeah. I know Kelly has something maybe she can add in about that as well. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of interesting. Things are changing a bit. In the States specifically, there's a number of insurance companies that are starting to include gender-related care um, uh, in their private insurance industry. But uh, my particular experiences with the insurance coverage that I have through uh, through my wife is they have transgender related care. I'm 
I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the surgery June 6th. Yay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, but I'm getting breast augmentation surgery covered by the insurance company mm, because it's, that's awesome. I, had, I had to jump through significant hoops to get them to agree to do it. Uh, it took, uh, probably close to six months of, of paperwork back and forth about, well, you know, how come the government's not paying for it? Well, I don't have an opinion on that. And that <laughs> and, and various other things going back and forth. But yes, there are a couple of insurance companies that are now starting to include gender related, um, healthcare and, and procedures, but they're not well advertised. They're not making a big deal about making people make my wife had to dig and she actually works at the company. She had to dig pretty hard to find it, uh, but it's there. Um, so, so it may not take the first phone call to them to say, Hey, do you cover this? Right. It might actually take a lot of digging or pushing to find out if they actually yeah, do. Yeah. And <laughs> actually in, in, in my case, it was, it was an employee that was basically digging through the records and said, transgender, hang on a second. My husband's transgender, blah, 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 blah. Look at this. So it's, um, it, it's not well known. It's not well advertised. Uh, they're not going to make a big deal out of it because if you take advantage of it, it'll be expensive and insurance companies don't like that. Um, but yeah, that's, there, there is some change and it, it, it's recent too. It's very, yeah, and it's, 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 it's important. Years. It's important to have that too, because like, I mean, sort of having, like you said, your, your wife works there. So sort of, um, you know, but even yourself, like you're able to say, okay, like, you know, these are my needs. This is how do we get this done? And I think that, um, being able to articulate what we need, um, comes from, um, sort of the experience of, of going through it. Um, I think it also comes with, with, um, sort of how long it's been since you've come out, um, that kind of stuff. And I think that like, like not everyone's in that position, right? Especially if you're, if you're younger, if you're sort of just emerging from, um, your sort of your teenage years and it's like, how do I go through this? So, I mean, why I understand that it's not advertised because of course, I mean, insurance companies, they, they don't want to pay that out. Um, so they're not going to advertise it. Um, so, and that's sort of where I think the, um, almost responsibility comes in of, of people who have gone through it and who know it's there to sort of almost take on that emotional labor for the people who can't and be like, Hey, look, you know, um, you have no other options. Like this is what we can do with your private insurance. Um, and, and, you know, this is how we go about it. Cause I think that's sort of the, the disparities that we see between, um, at, at least that I notice with trans men anyway, between Canada and the United States is that in the United States, there's so many, um, barriers, um, because of, you know, the costs associated with private insurance, um, you know, the cost of, of healthcare just to begin with for, for, mm -hmm. Uh, U.S. residents. Um, whereas uh, in Canada, we have we, we do have that the sort of privilege of health healthcare here, um, you know, and having certain trans related stuff covered. So that's sort of something that I see that um, is a huge sort of gap between between Canadian. Um, at least that's really comparisons I have is Canadian in the United States um, insurance coverage, um, private and public. Yeah. Yeah, like St Starbucks is like a good example of uh, in Canada, they do not cover gender care, but in the US, Starbucks employee get full gender care. And it's like one mm. of their like strong point. Um, at, at my job, I, I actually have uh, my, my, my insurance does cover $500 a year for trans stuff. Um, <laughs> that is it's a drop in the water. <laughs> it's a drop in the water, really. Like it's yes. like, oh, sure, I'll have a free electrolysis session this year. Yay! Um, here's the seventy thousand dollar bill from FFS. I guess you're not doing anything about that. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's yeah, it's very different Canada in in the U.S. I wish more mm -hmm. province started looking at Yukon and and decided that they were doing the right thing, but. Uh, it's going to take a while. There are costs that go beyond the um, the basic surgeries too, right? I don't mm -hmm. know, Stacey, if you have any knowledge of, from, from I, I know how, that there have been a lot of women that you've helped um, go through that process, but just as a, a, anybody have some idea how much that extra that's going to cost people? Well, you know, each person is unique and individual, right? You know, so the aftercare costs can be, you know, depending on how it's handled. 
Um, so I know with the um, people that participate in my trans group here in uh, my hometown, we have a fund where we provide three weeks of respite care for people that are returning from surgery. And what that That's includes wonderful. is you know, we go to their homes, we do their laundry, we help them with their um, personal care, we clean their house, we go shopping for them. Um, but we also have reserves. So, um, for instance, lube for dilation can be godly expensive if you're buying it at the drugstore. Um, so, um, as an agency, I purchase a bulk uh, from a medical supplier, and it ends up to be $2 a tube instead of $9 a tube. There's lots of tips and tricks that can be uh, utilized in order to reduce those costs. Um, such as bed pads. Um, you know, you can go to Shoppers Drug Mart and buy uh, disposable bed pads that are going to cost you, um, you know, 20 or $40 for a package. Or you can go to the dollar store and buy puppy pads, uh, which are essentially the same thing um, for, you know, four bucks for 15 of them. So it really, really is a, a unique way to uh, reduce those costs. Hmm. I like, brings, I like that. Sort of, oh, sorry, Carrie. It's okay. I was just going to say it brings up another point that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people that are out there that are trying to figure this out and, and are doing it on their own, right? There are so many resources out there and so many groups and people who want to help. And just um, joining some of these groups and, and getting to know other trans people, um, great places and resources to have your questions answered. Um, to be able to, uh, people who've had the experience and who know these things and can can give you some very real answers. And I, I encourage anybody who's not a part of those groups to go and seek them out. And certainly if if you are looking for them, you can certainly put a comment um, below and we will try and direct you somewhere uh, close to where you are uh, and uh, some of those groups that we know of. Yeah. Yeah, like I have, I have um, quite a bit of experience up in Northern Ontario. Um, you know, I, I know it's quite... <laughs> quite out of the way um you know it's almost uh, like it can be uh you, you get into rurality right semi-rural uh, rural communities so yeah definitely definitely reach out uh, if needed and and we'll uh we'll support you any way that we can sort of based on your jurisdiction really and um yeah it's important to use your resources like that's fantastic that the stacy has been able to sort of really dive into to the sort of different ways to go about getting those resources and how you can cut costs. I think, I think that's really important. And, and that's why it's so important to have representation from, from people who have gone through um, transition for so many years. I think that's great. Yeah. And then Stacy's experience is making what she's doing real and practical. Yes. Like it, it's, it's, you know, you absolutely need this kind of help and, it, and it's hard to get. Um, you can get food delivered, but you still have to, you know, drag it up the stairs or down the stairs or whatever and cook with it. Just it's, it's experience. It's, it's real life experience based care with capital C. It's amazing. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I, th I think that's one of the um, misconceptions of the tra of uh, the surgery that, um, you know, Oh, I'll be fine. I got supports. Right. But there's so much that those supports don't know. And, yeah. um, you know, having lived that life, having gone through this um, three times, um, I've really come to, you know, know the ins and outs of it. And um, my experiences have made it a wonderful experience for those that we've been able to help now. And support, I think, is, is you know, um, often people say, you know, I'm here to support you, I'm here, whatever you need. Um, and, like, of course, that's that's important. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize, um, except for people in the trans community who have gone through it, is that post-surgery um, support for trans people is oftentimes really up close and, and personal kind of support that, that can be needed. Like, I remember the first time that I had to shower after top surgery, uh, and I was like, okay, I can't reach my arms up to get like the pull down shower head to get the, um, the shampoo bottle even. Right. So it was like trying to figure out like, how are, are we going to do this? Right. So, um, you know, and that's, that's like, that's the only surgical experience I have, but, um, like Stacy said, like, 
um, needing like the bed pads, um, the lube for dilation. A lot of people um, don't realize that it's like when when we need support, it's like, okay, we need someone to say, okay, um, this is how you put the bed, the the wet pad down, or the the bed pad down. This is how, um, you know, how much even like lube to use or something like that, that a lot of people are are a hesitant to sometimes ask because it's so personal and B don't have someone in their support system who um, can understand to a point that they won't be thrown off. That if someone says, Hey, yeah, you know what? I ran out of lube. Um, I need some, can you please go get some for me at the drugstore? You need someone who can be like, yeah, sure. I know what to get. And I'm okay with doing that for you. So that's the sort of support that I think is important to have um, transgender community groups for. Yeah. Absolutely. You're, you're perfectly point on there, uh, Jason. Uh, you know, thank you for that. Um, one of the things that um, really comes to mind for myself and um, many of the people that I've been able to help, I've helped th literally thousands of girls transition. Um, Postoperatively is some of the medical complications that we have with surgery, uh, such as hypergranulation. Um, you know, and we, we can't see inside our vagina. Um, and, you know, even with a mirror, um, you know, postoperatively, it's not really the uh, easiest thing to identify. So um, hypergranulation is, um, you know, a very real thing that happens postoperatively, in particular with trans feminines, um, you know, and that's something that really needs to be um, taken care of medically. Um, and the process for that is to silver, to have silver dilate or silver nitrate applied to the hypergranulation to kill it. Um, but you know, that's inside your vagina. So you got to be comfortable enough to allow somebody to look there. And, um, you know, that's not an easy thing to do. Not especially with the swelling at the beginning or <laughs> swelling. It's having that, that openness and that sort of, um, that that sort of support that that can help you help you with that and also just even when you're in the medical setting um you know they're uh, like it like i don't have that experience of course um but i can i can only imagine that you know when misgendering comes into play um how discomforting that could be and, and you know uh, a lot of people who may present to to a medical clinic for that um to be um, misgendered while someone is, is treating your, your genitals can be extremely off putting. Um, that's something I've experienced, um, in terms of, um, misgendering for like in clinical settings, not necessarily post operative care, but, um, it's extremely off putting to sort of present like for myself, like with a beard and, and to be called she. And I'm like, the, the beard. You know what I mean? It's and it's like and, and we shouldn't we shouldn't go by that. You shouldn't say, you know, okay, well that person has a beard, so he that's a he. Um, you know, it's so it's difficult it's difficult to sort of walk that line between um between misgendering um in the clinics and and sort of uh comfort and being able to be yourself too. Yeah, it's that be difficult when your legal documents don't match your identity. Uh, because yeah. a lot of people are sticker for what's on the paper, what's in the system, and they're like, ah, this is what the machine says. And you're like, yeah. The other, the other point I wanted to bring up, uh, ladies and um, gentlemen, is that um, this is, you know, we often negate the timing. And, um, you know, I think the timing of our surgery is an important part, um, not only in terms of how we see ourselves in society and how you know we see our lives moving forward but also in terms of you know what's to come afterwards right so what i'm talking about is on my last uh big revision in uh, 2018 with uh grs montreal um about a month before my surgery date which was already confirmed and i was looking forward to it and everything i was honored to be awarded the women uh, national Inter international women's leadership award by our house of commons the unfortunate part was their big gala was um actually 30 days post-op now you know having undergone that intensity of surgery 
I was not in a very good shape uh, physically or mentally to be going to a red carpet gala, if you will. And um, it became, you know, this huge challenge um, to be on top of my game, if you will. And it was really difficult, um, you know, and I, I actually appeared carrying a pillow um, so I could sit on a hard chair and, and things like that. So um, timing is really, really an important part. And it, not only the timing moving up to the surgery, but, you know, really taking a look at your timing going forward. Yeah, I like for myself, um, I actually, like I said, with my surgery, that the sort of openings for it, because they have such a, a long wait list at McLean Clinic, um, the opening sport were kind of just dropped, right? It was just random, like, you know, call us, we'll squeeze you in before the end of the year. They had some openings. Um, you know, so I was torn between I was supposed to start my my undergrad thesis. Well, I had already started my undergrad thesis. Um, I just hadn't got to the actual research part of it yet doing the, you know, the sort of data collection. Um, so, you know, it was like I was torn between, all right, do I take this surgery date now or risk having to wait another, you know, sometimes up to 18 months if I go, you know, sort of I say, no, I can't do it. You go to the bottom of the list. Um and, and also risking sort of my entire undergrad because it relies on that research. Um, you know, so it was like, a, you know, and I had a great support at the, at the university as well. So I was fortunate in that regard that I could um, proceed with the surgery. Um, and I was able to do, you know, the research fine just afterwards in terms of, of how it was healing. Um, but, you know, I had a, a sort of um, easier recovery time pain wise than, than most experiences that I've heard. Um, I, you know, I was at like three, three, just extra strength over the counter Tylenol, um, like really just once a day for like three days. And then I was fine for the rest of, of my, uh, of my recovery. So, you know, had that been different, had there been complications, um, you know, stuff that you don't necessarily plan for, um, that could have potentially jeopardized my my entire degree so yeah like like stacy's right you have to ensure that like the timing leading up to it and afterwards is is gonna is gonna work for you especially if you have family um you know a lot of people have families that they have to consider yeah and i had one more experience post-operatively as well so i was using tremadol um pain medications um and my work um i for those that don't know, I, I work primarily in corrections and I work in 13 prisons um, supporting our LGBTQ uh, offenders. Um, but having taken those drugs um, also made me positive for opioids. So, um, you know, I had to have clearance in order to get into the prison because I was identifying as an opioid user. Yeah. And it's, it's, the, and it's part of your job, right? Like you don't want to risk, um, you know, like, I, like I'm familiar with, with a lot of the sort of um, logistics of the justice system when you're working with that population, because like with my degree, um, you know, that, that sort of, you know, not disclosing that had Stacy not disclosed that and, um, and, and didn't, you know, she showed up positive on, on her test that risks her, her sort of her entire affiliation with, with that prison, her, her entire, like her work really. So it's like, you know, there's a lot of jobs like that, especially people who work in healthcare settings, um, you know, registered nurses, stuff like that. Um, I don't know if they still do sort of routine um, drug tests and whatnot. I know that there are some sectors, like if you're working with, with uh, addictions and mental health, they will give you random drug tests. Um, you know, so having to be upfront um, saying, hey, you know what, I had surgery, um, you know, like it's opioids, like it, it's for pain. Um, not only does that sort of, you have to out yourself if you're not already out, but also, um, it's, it's the risk that you take if you do. And if you don't basically. Yep. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Guys, I really appreciate your time and we're getting close to the end here. I just want to give a moment to, to kind of wrap things up and give you an opportunity each to maybe share something that you think is really important that you want to make sure people know, uh, either going into surgery or post-surgery, whatever, whatever it is that you feel they need. I'm going to chime in real quick because I feel like I got to get off here. Um, I, for, for myself, I want to just say that, you know, 
if you feel that you are in need of surgery, go for it. But if you feel that you don't need it, don't go for it. Um, you know, each person is unique individual. It does not negate you any more or any less if you've had surgery or you've not had surgery. We are who we are and we are who we see we are. And that's the bottom line. Well said, Stacy. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's pretty much what I was going to say. Um, surgery, medical transition, and, and all transition, the really like legal and social one. Um, you pick what works for you. You pick what you need. You 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 go with you with uh, well your 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 ability to get those because sometimes you want HRT but your your body just can't handle it. Right? Some people just have conditions. Um, and same thing for surgery and same thing for everything else. Sometimes you just can't afford uh, to change your entire wardrobe. So you don't do it, right? Uh, but you do what you can or want. And, and that's enough, really. You, you, there's no threshold that makes you a real trans person after a certain point or having finished your transition is such a myth. You never really finish your transition, no matter when you start. It's interesting you say finish your transition. Do we ever finish our transition? No. Oh, and you die, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's the final transition. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. For when it like when it comes to surgery, I think um, you know, one thing to consider that you like uh, you know, and I agree with with both what the lady said about um, you know, if it's right for you, then then go for it. If you don't think it's right for you, then then you can wait. There is always later. Um, you know, there's no sort of timeline, and, and it doesn't make you any less valid. Now, having said that, if you do go for surgery, I think one thing that we don't talk about enough is that you don't have to um, sort of go with the the typical binary sort of um, aesthetic in, in some situations. Like I know um, for myself, um, I didn't actually get the the nipple grafts. Um, you know, I just went um, straight line right across, um, um, sort of just got them cut off and, and contoured and, and whatnot, um, and then dealt with the aesthetics afterwards in terms of tattooing and stuff. Um, but I do know that there's a lot of non-binary people who don't take hormones. Um, you know, they, they have no interest in that. Uh, they want top surgery. Um, you, they don't have, you don't have to go with, with a binary experience for that. Um, you know, some people uh, will want that. Some people will just, you know, the appendages need to go for them and it doesn't matter if it looks masculine after. And I think that's something um, for, for trans, trans men and, and non-binary people anyway, I can't speak to sort of um, to the feminization. I don't want to speak for, for a community that of course I have no experience with myself. Um, but when it comes to, to, you know, uh, trans men and non-binary people, you can still receive some surgeries that allow you to remain non-binary, gender neutral, gender queer, um, without having to sort of go back into the binary, um, that's just that's to sort of qualify. That one, that was an interesting one for me too, because I've found myself in a situation where, um, to, to obtain the surgery, I have to have, uh, HRT and HRT has certain things that have but because of it and being non-binary, I wasn't necessarily looking for those things, um, although I have found them to be very affirming and, and appreciated them. But, um, you, you know, I, w there is still some gatekeeping, um, being able to get to those surgery points for, for non-binary people. I, I'm glad to hear that that's the, not the case with you, Cash, and, and hopefully we'll keep uh, moving forward and, and there'll be more things. I, I'm really pleased with the way things have been going. I've said many times, I probably could not have come out like Stacy did way back. Um, but uh, now's the time. And, and as you've mm -hmm. all said, you, you go with your own timing. This is the right timing for me. So, yeah. There's many ways to customize your surgery. And uh, sometimes you just need to find the right surgeon. Yeah. Kelly, did you have something to add? Uh, the, the support system is something I'm just covering as I'm getting ready for my surgery because I'm pre-op is I'm hearing from a number of people. It's extremely important um, to, to, to build a support system around yourself um, that can handle some of the things I've got, some amazing friends and I've got family and um, my, my mom and my brother both basically said, well, you're not going there alone. And uh, it's like, oh, that's, 
was beautiful. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes that can surprise you. Um, you know, yeah. I think, I think sometimes, um, you know, we, we go through like, a, at least from my experience anyway, is that we go through um, navigating a lot of difficulty and a lot of turmoil with some of our closest people when we come out, um, you know, and, and when it comes to, to needing support sometimes, and that's not the case for everyone. Sometimes it's awful and, and lonely, yeah. but for some people, they can kind of surprise and be like, no, like, you know what? I love you you're my person, you need me right now, let's do this. You know, you're not going to go yeah. uh, go at it alone. And I give a lot of kudos to people who have had to go through it alone. I know I know several people who, you too. know, drove themselves to surgery, you know, next day drove themselves home, you know, still under anesthesia, still in pain, <laughs> um, you know, getting their own groceries, you know, like it, it's, it, it's, I can't imagine. So I give them, that's a lot of kudos to them because support, mm -hmm. support makes a big difference. This forum, I mean, I'm getting my surgery in eight weeks. I was dying to hear what you guys had to say. Yes. Yeah, uh, so excited yeah. for you. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Um, Stacy had to go, as you said, she was uh, not feeling well. So uh, we're very glad to have had Stacy here and Cash and Chloe. Um, very much appreciate your input. And I'm sure that other people will also appreciate uh, what they've heard. Obviously, this is still just touching the tip of the iceberg, right? There are so many more things um, and the conversation doesn't have to end. Anybody who wants to add or add questions or even add comments, um, we'd be happy to see those in the comments below. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will try to answer them or direct them towards uh, our guests here if, if they come in and uh, let them answer them as best they can as well. So thanks for joining us in the Transform. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.